by uh, Miri Benchen. She's a professor at the Technion, which is Bowery. And um, you've had several papers on how to do uh, fluids and other kinds of uh, vector field type things on surfaces. Okay, I'll awesome smell them. Of the rendering, 
you can see uh, a lot of lines, and each one of these lines is called a hatching. Okay. So if I give you this as an application, I tell you, okay, take a 3D model and generate an image which looks like this, uh, you might want to um, find a way to represent these hatches. Okay, what do you need to know about them? They report to the surface in order to be able to draw them. If you want to know how to generate them based on geometry or other things, and finally, you want to be able to draw them on the surface using the representation that you have. Um, so we'll talk about each of these, um, each of, each of these options. So in general, if you look at the, at the representation of a hatching, basically these are a bunch of orientations. Okay? You want to know in which direction the line that the artist drew is going to face. Okay? And these orientations can be specified in image space. Maybe, maybe you can say, okay, when I look at the rendered image at every pixel, I have some orientation, which is what you see here. Ah, which is what you see here on the right. Okay, these are actually two orientations because sometimes you have cross hatching. Or you can have the orientations uh, in object space, meaning on the surface itself, I have at every point some direction that I want to use. The way to generate these orientations, uh, there are actually many ways, and in, in some uh, contexts for um, NPR, this is one of the more interesting challenges, and on that I will actually not talk today. Uh, one option is to use curvature directions. Mm -hmm. So this is actually uh, very related to the, talk that, to the tutorial that you heard by uh, Marcel about color matching, which also uses um, curvature directions as well. <coughs> Another option, which is more recent, is since humans are involved in the process to use machine learning. So you take a bunch of data generated, a bunch of illustrations generated by artists, and then you do some machine learning and out goes the uh, orientations. But finally, once you have a set of orientations, either on the image, either on the uh, in 2D or on the surface itself, you want to be able to render them. And now, uh, the, the way to render them is by placing evenly spaced treatment. So now let's kind of zoom in a bit from the big applications of pen and ink and just focus on the smaller application of them. Um, but the input and output is specified like this. I have my input is a vector for point. Okay, this is let's say the image space orientations that I got for my hatching. And the output that I want to generate is an even space uh, streamlined illustration. Okay, so <coughs> I want to get these bunch of lines as an output. And this is in fact useful for other applications not only for the for example for vector field visualization. Okay, so you know, what's a streamline? Right? So if I have a vector field if I have an orientation at every point, and I place a particle at a given point, and now I look how the particle follows the vector field. So it moves a bit, and then it moves to the vector field, and then it moves another bit, and so on and so on. The image that you see here is basically they took a LED light, LED light, they placed it in a stream, and then they took a photograph with the long exposure. Okay, so the path that the LED light traveled along the stream is exactly the, uh, the streamline that I'm looking for. The way to generate this uh, such a streamline is, is that exactly like I said, basically, uh, you pick a seed point, okay, you pick the beginning of the, uh, the path, and then you trace the streamline, you walk along the path, and somehow, and, and you repeat this, okay, so you pick a point, you trace the streamline, and you pick another point, you trace another streamline, and so on, and so on. So this is the general uh, scheme of things. <coughs> of course, there are details in order to, to get this to work. Uh, by the way, tell me if you have questions that will make everything more interesting. Yeah. Okay, so which C points to pick? Right? So in this example, I just picked this one, but what happens if I pick another C point? I will get a different illustration. Right? Another question is, how do I trace the streamline? Okay, how do I get from the pointwise orientation information to the actual uh, polygon, polyline which represents the curve? And finally, what do, when do I stop? At some point, you have to say, okay, this streamlined uh, placement was done, and now I have to, uh, I'm done with this. Uh, yeah, this is your So, um, there are many tactics to, to do this. Okay, one of the most, uh, I guess, one of the popular ones. So, I'm, I'm writing down here the, the reference to the relative papers, and uh, if you'd like, I think the slides will be available. Um, so one option is to say I'm going to do furthest points from the existing lines that I have. 
So I'll just randomly pick one set like one seed point, I trace the curve, and then I already have one curve, but then let's say I exit the domain, and then I pick another seed point which is further away, furthest away from all the other seed points. Okay? And I repeat this process until all the, all my space is covered. Okay, so if I cannot find if uh, I pick a new point and it's closer to all the existing streamlines than some specified distance <coughs> which it provides, then I stop. So given these answers to, to questions one and three, there are many questions, okay, how do you trace the stream? Okay. Everybody alive? <laughs> you can say no, but then it will be. Oh, then you can up. So um, at this point, math comes in. Okay. So um, the relation, the mathematical relation between the um, uh, streamline and the vector field is a differential <coughs> relationship. So if my vector field is uh, like, like it says here, I have at every point of my domain. Okay. So point is x is in L two. I have a uh, vector. I have an arrow pointing south. Okay. And now I'm looking for the the path of a particle. The part of the particle I call it x of t. Okay, so t is a time parameter, it's just a number, and I want to know at each point in time what will the particle end up. Um, and the relationship, and I know v and I want to find x. Okay? And it's just, you know, if you know the velocity and you want to find the, the uh, trajectory, you just need it. Right? So the derivative of the trajectory is the velocity. A different way to look at it without physics is to say, <coughs> I'm looking for a curve such that the tangent to the curve is actually, uh, the tangent to the curve at every point is the vector field that you specify. So this process is called integrating a vector field uh, because you, um, you are giving derivative information and you want to kind of integrate that to, to get the velocity. Okay, so so far, you know, the, the, if we look at the type of things that we have, the type of objects, I have P which is continuous, just a, a number in R, and I have V which is continuous, and X is continuous. So everything is continuous. If I want to be able to do some sort of computation, I need to discretize it. So I'm going to discretize time, okay, just basically slice it into, let's say, equal uh, spacings of, of uh, identity. And space for now will be discretized as a uniform grid. Okay. Um, given the simple discretization, we can just do, you know, uh, formal differences. So we can approximate the derivative, which I have here, you know, as just the difference uh, between x, you know, the location at the next time step minus the location at the current time step uh, divided by the, the size of the time step. And this is a simple uh, approximation for the velocity. And using this, I can uh, basically, so what I did is I, I multiplied by delta t, and I switched x t, x t to the other side, and now I have a scheme. Okay. So if I'm looking for a way to generate, the, to trace the streamlines, I'm looking for some uh, iterative scheme that says if I know the C point now, what will be the C point at the next step? So let's say I'm starting, let's say I'm starting at the point x0, and then um, the, the scheme says, okay, now you have to move in the direction of the vector field, vector field for a length delta t. So I'm moving it for a length delta t, now I have a new point, x of t and the plus delta t. And so on, okay? <laughs> and this scheme is also called Euler integration or Euler forward integration if you come up as well in uh, restock. This is a very, very primitive uh, scheme for solving this problem. And uh, one of the problems with this is if I take a different delta t, if I take a larger delta t, then I'll get a very different streamline. Okay, so the pink line that you see here is with uh, this um, time step, and if I go further away, then I get something. And in some sense, you will always have numerical error, right? If, if, since you don't know what the actual vector field is and you're trying to approximate it, you, some, some numerical error will, uh, will be um, Okay, so can, can we do this better? <coughs> so for example, if we know that the actual streamline is a circle, yeah, so uh, let's say we have a vector field which rotates, and we know that the actual streamline is a circle, then, uh, we know that the result of this uh, algorithm cannot be correct, right? Because we will get a spiral. We'll get further and further away from one point. So this only works well for very small steps. One way to make this better is uh, to kind of cut, cut, the, cut short the curve up. Okay, so if uh, I'm going in the direction, in the tangent direction to the, the curve, I know 
by definition that I'm going in the wrong direction. So one way to solve this is to say, okay, just do half an honor step, go half the, the time step, then look at the vector field that you get there, take it back to the origin, and now use it for a full time step. Okay? So now instead of uh, going in this direction and shooting off the curve, I'm shooting into the curve. And this process is called the uh, loop integration, and there are like a bazillion of those. There are many ways, there are many options to, um, to use parameters and <laughs> okay, so if we kind of specify the math for this, um, we say that, okay, the, the, I'm looking at the current step, I'm going half a time step in the direction that I have in the current step, and now I have a new point. Okay, so this is the point of the field. And now I'm checking what the vector field is, is at the second point, and I'm using that for a point. Okay, so this is uh, one way to, to make this um, uh, integration simple. The last thing is you can use much larger time steps. Okay, so what you see here in red is the Euler integration using a very uh, small time step, and the Rogue Kuta in, in green, the Euler is in red, and Rogue Kuta is in green, obviously, because it's green setup. Um, and uh, <coughs> the, the time steps here for Euler are very small, and the time step for Rogue Kuta you can see is much larger, and still you get exactly the same approximation. So if you ever need to integrate something, you know, skip Euler. Okay. Um, but in some sense, I kind of tricked you so far, right? Because the, my original plan was to, to do this on the surface. So I, I don't necessarily want to walk in, in, in the image space. I might want to directly trace the flow lines on the surface. Okay, so how, how would I be able to do that? So taking everything to the surface now, uh, if I look again at, at the objects that I have, then uh, my points lie on some, uh, some surface M, and the vector field is basically a vector at the tangent space at every point. Again, I'm looking for the particle path, and uh, the equation is, is the same as before. Okay, now instead of having, I, I, again, I have to do the discretization, but instead of having uh, you know, uh, plain, uh, uh, regular grid, I have a bunch, which is always what you have when you need to discretize this. Graphics, yeah. So I'm trying to do the previous scheme, yeah? Okay, so okay, I walk along in the direction of the vector field, and then what happens? I shoot off the surface, right? So if I'm living on the surface and I take it, it's like, you know, you walk too far off the face of the earth. Uh, so if I'm going in the direction tangent to, to the planet, I will walk off the planet um, if I go too far away. So in this case, if you're walking on the, <coughs> the money too far away, you're going to fall off. So uh, this um, Euler integration, by definition, is not going to work on, on surfaces. So how do we fix this? Um, the idea is to say, okay, what is actually a straight line? Yeah, a straight line, um, what, what, is, uh, what does it mean that I take a, a location and I'm uh, adding a vector to it? It means that I'm walking in a straight line. And a straight line on the surface is uh, geodesic. Okay? So instead of doing this Euler integration by saying, okay, I'm adding some displacement in, in a specific direction, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to start from a point on my surface and I'm going to compute the geodesic in a given direction. And then I will end up at the next point and then I will repeat. Okay, so basically the algorithm carries over, but I have to replace tracing straight lines with using geodesics. And the length is the same. Right? Okay. So that sounds nice, right? Okay, and, on, and in fact, if you know some differential geometry, you know that on a smooth surface you can define this uh, um, differential equations, which says what I, what I just described. You pick a point x as your initial condition, you pick a direction b at the tangent space, and then you walk in that direction in a straight way. Okay, so straight means geodesic uh, geodesic. And this has a unique solution no matter where you start, no matter which direction. But, okay, so this is an example. For example, if I'm on the toes, and I start from a point, <coughs> Uh, let's say this is my direction, I will end up circling the toes. If I go in this direction, then I will kind of wiggle around. So this sounds great, right? The problem is, when you shift the triangle meshes, this no longer works. So the same differential equation, which says start at the point, pick a direction, and continue straight, has no uh, unique solution on the triangle mesh. So if you, uh, for example, if your direction points into a vertex, okay? So this is what, what happens, what you see here in the drawing is if I take my 
uh, triangle mesh and I cut it through and I open it up. Yeah. So if I have, the, let's say, the corner of a cube, then I get here a missing part. And uh, if I do this and I try to walk straight towards the vertex, I, the, there is no solution. I will be really stuck at the vertex because any, um, if I'm just trying to, sorry, if I'm trying to find the shortest uh, path, if I'm trying to try to find the, the shortest path from a point in some direction, there is no solution on the, on the triangle. Uh, on, in this case, if I'm shooting toward the, toward the vertex, if I'm shooting toward, toward the spherical vertex, if I'm shooting towards the hyperbolic vertex, means that I have the negative Gaussian curvature, then I write a multiple solution. Okay. So in general, this idea of um, starting from a point and trying to find the shortest, uh, the shortest uh, path is not going to be an alternative. So this is for the, the shortest geodesic. Okay, and the smooth case, shortest geodesics and straightest geodesics are the same thing. So I'm trying to <coughs> um, So in a, in a very nice uh, approach from which is kind of uh, all by now, the idea was okay. I cannot find the shortest path starting from a uh, point and give it a walking in some direction, but I can find something just straightest. So uh, the condition that I'm going to work with is I'm looking at the path such that the uh, sum of angles on both sides of the path are the same. And for this condition, you can show that uh, there is always a, a, there always exists a unique solution. So now we can take this idea of straight geodesics and plug it into this uh, streamline tracing uh, idea exactly like before. And now I'm guaranteed both that I have uh, I can run the algorithm and always have a solution, and that I can um, uh, trace the flow. So this is one example of uh, the type of figures, the type of images that you get uh, when you're tracing on the surface. Some things which are missing for this batch can be useful is uh, you want to be able to do the smart sequoid sampling directly on the surface, like I said before, which is also non-trivial. And um, you want to have some technique for stopping when you're tracing the stream. Right? So you need some uh, machinery for uh, quick intersection tests on the surface. <coughs> There's also an extension for this idea of the but I will not uh, go too much into it. Basically, you again switch all the pluses with geodesics, but now you have a vector, a vector which is at the wrong location. So I have a vector at this point, and I need it at a different point. So the trick for moving vectors around on the, on the surface is called parallel transform. You don't usually, you don't really need the truck. Okay, there's a max uh, equation for that, but it's kind of. Uh, requires a lot of machinery to, to describe, so uh, I'll not get into it. Just some examples of how this looks. So this is, uh, the blue one is uh, Euler integration, and uh, the green one is only Puta. So again, I'm tracing streamlines using these two algorithms directly on the triangle, using the straight statistics. Okay, so to recap, um, a discrete vector field is just a bunch of sample orientation. You might have length or might not have length. Uh, and we're interested in discrete vector fields on all surfaces. <coughs> These orientations for our tangent surfaces. We can render them by tracing streamlines uh, intelligently, and there are some interesting problems here regarding how we choose the streamline uh, seeds, how we, how we choose the starting positions, and how we go uh, straight. And uh, on the surface, if you're trying to um, Computer geodesic uh, on this on the split triangle meshes, you should be aware that there are many there are some uh, many possibilities to, to discretize the uh, the smooth equations. It's something which hold, which in the smooth case kind of uh, align to the same thing. Uh, on the triangle meshes, you get uh, different uh, projects. Okay, so that was that about a little bit about the illustration and a lot about streamline tracing. And I will switch to. Hey guys, <clears throat> um, I'm moving and I will show the next two applications. Um, before I begin, I have like a short disclaimer. Someone must told me that good teaching is good cheating, and I'm teaching a lot. So, in particular, about these two methods that I will show, I don't really show the full details. So if any of you actually is familiar with the methods, you might notice that there are differences, and I'm not really showing the actual method. So the slides were, were prepared in the 
idea of showing uh, like a couple of concepts. And I believe that showing the full method will be uh, a bit of a stretch. So that's why I simplified and might proper simplified uh, the methods, but that's the general idea. Um, so um, actually, the first application will be somewhat related to what Miri told, uh, told you and uh, could, could be considered as, as an improvement. And what I want you to think about is how do we visualize motion? So in this context, we have a vector field, which is fixed throughout this application. And we want to somehow visualize it with, with an image or a bunch of images. So as Miri told you, for instance, you can just trace the flow lines. And for instance, you can put a couple of these. And this field shows a sparse representation of the vector field. Because for instance, between those flow lines, between those uh, blue lines, you don't really know what happens. But like conceptually, we like, integrate in our head what happens in between, and we imagine that the vector field just rotates around this phase or, or this uh, other object. So we will try to improve on that. And the basic, uh, and we, we actually uh, come from come to it from a, from a different approach. And for this approach, we will meet uh, the heat equation, uh, which you uh, should have uh, seen in one of the other talks. And basically, uh, and I will just uh, briefly remind what, what, what does it mean. So the idea for the heat equation is that we have some <coughs> temperature, which is described by this F. So this is just a scalar. And we want to measure or describe how this heat is propagated on some domain. So I'm always working with curved domains, but this is true in, in general, also for ambient domains. So on the right hand side, we have a, a spatial <coughs> space derivative, which is given by the Laplacian, or in, in the context of curved domains, this is the Laplacian domain operator. And on the left hand side, uh, we have the, the temporal derivative, basically the, the change in time uh, of this temperature. So intuitively, uh, what you should imagine is that if we, are, if we have this surface on the left and someone gives us an initial distribution of heat, uh, over time it will basically uh, uh, propagate uniformly in all directions and it will also get diminished. So for instance, if we start from, uh, from the left side, where the highest temperature is 1, for instance, it will, it will, get, uh, it will get colder smaller uh, over time. So that's great. And if we want to, again, uh, consider uh, <coughs> the idea of motion, so we get some kind of motion here. But actually, if we will plot a sequence of these images, we can actually see how this uh, heat is propagated over the surface. So you can see that from left to right, basically, we have a uniform distribution uh, of and uh, as I said, uh, uniform isotropic is basically the same. Uh, so essentially, uh, and you can ask by now, how is this actually related to vector fields, right? We don't really have any vector field. So we basically try to, in the next couple of slides, we we'll try to uh, solve these two issues. First, we don't want this uniform distribution. We actually want to to incorporate some direction into the system. And we also don't want to use a full sequence of images. We just want a single image uh, to visualize our vector. So we will first try to tackle uh, uh, the issue of uh, uniformity. And uh, one way to do that is to, again, go back to the heat equation. And one way to write it is that instead of using, using the Laplacian, we can just write it as the divergence of the gradient of this temperature. So if gradient and divergence uh, look weird, gradient is based basically measures how the function is changing on the domain. So this is the right hand side uh, picture. You should imagine that someone gives you a, a function that is, for instance, zero here, and it uh, go up in values towards here. And when, when we take the gradient, we basically get a direction per point of the domain that just points in the uh, change uh, in the direction of the change of the function. The divergence, uh, while it is a local property, in order to uh, 
think about it, it is actually easier to think about domains. So if we have this omega uh, domain, just enclose it with some, with some curve, and we have a vector field in this domain, and we just integrate along this boundary curve uh, the directions of the vector field that we have with respect to the normal uh, of the curve. Uh, so geometrically, we just try to measure how much stuff go, goes out of the domain and how, how much stuff comes in. And uh, whatever, I mean, I'm not showing the, the, the actual equations for divergence, but the geometric uh, picture should, should be enough for us. And what we want to do now is, is as I said, uh, incorporate some, some direction information. And one way to do that is to say, OK, if someone gives us a vector field, let's just take the inner product between this vector field and the gradient of the function. And the reason why there is uh, like a, a small square is because this, this equation is not correct. There's something missing. And uh, the one thing that is missing is that if we take the, the inner product between a vector and, and, and another vector, we actually get a, get a scalar. So it doesn't make sense to take the divergence of the scalar because we actually need a vector back. So there are several options here to choose. One intuitive uh, option that comes to mind is to just take the vector itself. So geometrically, wh what it means is just is think of, a, of, of paint that he drops into, into some water or stuff like that. When the water flows, it picks this paint, and this is modeled by this inner product between the vector field and the gradient of the function. So the function is the paint, and the vector field is the velocity of the fluid. And once we have this projection, we actually attach it to the fluid, and that's, that means that we actually take the vector field back. So that's why we could take the vector So, I mean, overall, we, we actually get a, a partial differential equation, which is actually very known. It's popular, it's known. It's called anisotropic diffusion. And it can be considered as some generalization of the heat equation, of course. And you can see uh, below that if we start from the same initial conditions, uh, so we have some, some now it's not temperature, it's, uh, I prefer to consider it as paint. So we have some paint, and someone gives us a vector field. If we integrate or solve this equation in time, we'll actually get some notion of, of direction. And this is, of course, not the final uh, result that we have. So, I mean, don't get a long time by now. We will improve on that. But hopefully, uh, you are convinced that this actually gives us some notion of, of direction. For instance, we can see that the vector field goes from left to right or from right to left. This is basically what we get by now. And in order to actually solve this, uh, since it's both continuous in time and space, we basically need to integ integrate both. So just assume that someone gives us a, a function, a paint on the given time t, and we want to take it to the next time, which is uh, denoted by t plus delta t. So we will have some, some integration rule for that. And we also integrate space. So I won't spend too much time on, on temporal discretization. We will basically uh, do something very simple, uh, the same as, as we reconsider, which is uh, uh, which is the follows. Uh, one way to, uh, uh, to discretize this uh, time derivative is just to consider uh, finite uh, differences or forward finite differences, uh, which is denoted as shown above. And uh, since we have a rule for, for the time derivative <coughs> of the function, we can basically come up with this rule. Okay, so in order to compute uh, color in the next time step, which is t plus delta t, we take the current uh, color and we add to it uh, the change in the color, which is given by this anisotropic uh, diffusion part, right? Which is the D, then AV is just this VV transport, and just uh, uh, write it differently. And this is known as explicit integration, and the reason uh, why it is called explicit is because once we are given the color at the current time, we can compute everything on the right hand side, right? Because if f is the color, then we use f of t, which is which we currently have, 
And V is completely independent of <coughs> the evolution in time. V, as we said, is fixed. It, it is not changing in time, and of course, it is not also affected by, by this process. So once we are given the color, we can just compute the right hand side, and we are given new color, and we can just repeat it for a couple of steps. <coughs> so this is the time integration. And uh, now I will go to the uh, spatial discretization. And basically what we need to do is to discretize the gradient and the divergence. Uh, we will spend like a couple of, of uh, slides on the gradient, and you will see that the divergence actually comes very naturally uh, when we have uh, the gradients already in place. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for the spatial discretization, we took a, a very popular, a common, uh, discrete uh, elements. Uh, which you probably already seen in, in the other talks, and I also believe that you will see uh, during the conference. So functions uh, are discretized uh, by uh, piecewise linear uh, elements, which basically means that if we just consider a single triangle, then this triangle is uh, made of three vertices, and it, for each of these vertices, we can arbitrarily choose the value of the function of this vertex. Um, so now we have three values, and in order to actually get a function that is uh, defined over the full domain, we linearly interpolate between these uh, three values. So this is just given in the equation that you see here. Basically, um, this can be computed with barycentric co coordinates. Just imagine that we are interested in some, for instance, point here in the triangle, and we just uh, evaluate uh, uh, the values of uh, these basis elements. So each of our basis elements is also called a, a hat function, which means that we have one in the vertex, for here it's P1, and zero everywhere else. Okay? And so we have, we have a hat basis uh, function for each of the vertices. Okay, so now we want to actually define the gradient uh, for this function, and you can see that it is enough to, to actually <coughs> consider this triangle, and once we have uh, the equation for this triangle, we can just repeat it for all of the other triangles. That the, the image just stays the same. It doesn't really matter uh, on the rest of the triangles. So how do we do that? Um, basically, since the gradient is a linear operator, we can just say, okay, I'm interested in the gradient of the function. I can just take it inside the sum, and also take out these uh, scalar coefficients. And what I actually needed to do is just compute the gradient of the basis element. So this is not, I mean, in some sense, once I add the gradient of, for all of the basis elements, I can just multiply this by the scalar coefficients of the functions, and I'm done. Okay, so this is what we actually tend to do. And one a nice geometric uh, observation about piecewise linear functions is that since they are linear per, per triangle, the gradient is, as, is actually constant. So whatever we do here, we actually, is, we actually expect to get just a single vector per uh, triangle. And actually, it turns out that uh, the gradient of, of this hat basis element uh, has a very nice uh, formula, and this is nothing else but the edge, yeah, this is the edge, let's go back, this is P2 and P3, so this is just the edge opposite to the vertex that we are interested in now, and we rotate this edge by 90 degrees, and we divide by twice the, the, track, the area of the triangle, and that's it. So if we actually want to compute the gradient of the function, we just repeat it for each of the three basis elements that we have, and we get this nice formula. And this is the gradient. Okay. Um, yeah. So I mean, you you can you can consider it as three different uh, uh, vectors that I just blend with some different coefficients that, that depend on the function. Actually. Okay. So this was the gradient, and as I said, uh, for the divergence, we, we can basically take a very similar approach and arrive with, with a different uh, formula, of course, but having very uh, similar insights.
But I want to take a different approach in order to, to actually define the gradient, the, the divergence. And the way that we do that is we say, OK, one of the classic results in differential geometry is that for any function in vector field, we know that the <coughs> integration by parts equation, which is basically written here, uh, holds. And this is true for any domain. So this is true for the, for the whole surface, but this is also true for any uh, partial domain of the surface that we take. And I mean, this is more of a mathematical motivation, but we will stick to that. We say, OK, in order to, once I have the gradient, this rule here actually allows me to switch between gradient and divergence. And we will see in a second what, 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 what I mean by that. Uh, one maybe uh, a small uh, comment about this equation. In general, there is another component which is related to the boundary of the domain that I'm interested in. Uh, but in our case, we just assume that this boundary integral is zero. So that's why it does not appear in this equation. Um, so in any case, how, how can we take this equation and actually discretize it? So the way to do that is saying, is saying OK, we have these vector fields and we have these functions. And this, in the discrete case, just are just vectors, right? Vectors of, of values. Functions are one scalar per, vector, uh, per ver vertex. And vectors, since they are a constant, uh, piecewise constant vector fields, are just three values per phase. And now we want to compute these integrals. And the way that we do that is, for instance, let's, let's consider the left uh, term. So these are just the multiplication between two functions, right? We take the f function and the divergence of the vector, which is also a function, and we want to compute the integral of that. But since we sample these functions only on vertices, we need to somehow account for the missing integrals. And uh, the, the picture that you need to have here is that I have this vertex. I have this vertex here, and I sample these functions, f and divergence of, of v here, but I don't really account for what happens here. So the way to do that is just to take some uh, multiplication with the area of the vertex. And this is what this AV means. AV is nothing else but the mass matrix, which is the lamped mass matrix in this case, uh, which basically means that we just place on the diagonal uh, the area of the vertex. And that, that <coughs> way, we actually cover the whole surface, the area surface of the, of the interval. And we basically do the same here. Uh, the main <coughs> difference is that uh, this, uh, this is evaluated on vector fields. Because now we have V, and we need to couple it with another vector field, which is the gradient of some function. So now, instead of taking the uh, mass of the vertices, <coughs> we actually take the triangle areas. So that's why it's A of A. OK, so once we have this equation, and we know that it holds for any function in any vector field, we can just remove this function and, uh, and vector field, and we can just stay with an operator uh, equation. So basically, we get this uh, equation that shows above, and from now on, it's just linear algebra. We can just take this to the other side and multiply by the inverse of this matrix, which is diagonal. So, and we also assume that the areas are okay, so the inverse actually exists. And uh, we get we get the notion of divergence. And this is nothing else but, but linear algebra. Once you have the gradient ma uh, matrix and these mass matrices, you can construct the divergence. And it, and actually, one can show. I mean, I I won't show it. One can show that using this matrix and multiplying it by the gradient, we actually get back a, a cotangent rate Natasha, that you saw in one of the other talks. So this is not, I mean, just in terms of uh, how, it, how it is related to the uh, other stuff that you also saw. OK. So um, yeah, so just, just a summary. Um, let, let me go back for a second for the, for the equation, just to see where we are at. So, as I said, someone gives us a function that I didn't really say how, but I'm gonna. And I show how to discretize the gradient, the divergence, and this AV is nothing else but the VV transpose. This is 
it can be sort of local. Just compute this uh, uh, product between V and V transfers. And there you have it. You can just integrate this, this equation. Uh, so that, that basically covers the first uh, issue that we had of this uh, non -unif uh, of uniformity. And now we'll try to, to uh, get rid of this sequence of images. And here it's very, it's very simple. Uh, the way that we do that is just, instead of uh, uh, just play, uh, tracing from a couple of points, we'll just take an image that is defined over the full domain. Okay? And here it's, it's a flat domain, but you can just assume that we take uh, just a, a random noise over, the, over this body, and we'll start to integrate from this random noise. And this will allow us to actually get a notion of, of direction uh, using a single image. So I'll just show a couple of results. Um, uh, and these results are taken from, uh, from this paper by Dewald and uh, Rumpf uh, from 2000. Whatever, it's, a, it's an old paper, relatively. Um, <clears throat> so basically, uh, these two results just show uh, uh, they had, as I said, it's more, their method is more complicated than what they showed, and they have some parameter that allows to control the diffusion. So for instance, here we have less diffusion, and here we have more diffusion. But, so you can see that on the left hand side, we actually get uh, more details. Um, on the curve domain, you can see that here they, they try to visualize the curvature directions of these uh, nice uh, surfaces. And lastly, uh, of course, on the body, again, it's curvature directions. And these are also uh, from the paper. OK, so that covers beautiful uh, visualization. Uh, OK, so now, now I go to fluid simulation. And um, here I. <coughs> I will try to work more on, on intu intuition and less on, on details. Uh, there is really a lot of, of math that goes into, into the stuff. Uh, so, I, I mean, I will try just to show you as little as we need just to get going. And so essentially, uh, the problem that, what, that we consider is that we have this flow of, of water, of fluid, and, and, and it is deposited on, on some curved domain. And we want to understand how it is evolved over time. So you should assume that if this is the fluid in time zero, after some time, some stuff happens to it. And this stuff uh, can be modeled with a velocity. So you should assume that each of the particles of fluid actually feels some velocity, and it is being pushed by this velocity. So th this is one a component, but actually another component is the vorticity of the fluid. And uh, in order to uh, get an understanding of what is the vorticity of the fluid, just assume that someone gives us some vector field, which can be the velocity of, of this fluid. And let's say that you are on top of this particle, and you flow with this particle. And what you want to measure is what is the spin or how much uh, the vector field rotates. And the way that you do that mathematically is to compute the curl of the vector field. Now, <clears throat> in coordinates, the curl has uh, like a very simple uh, um, explanation. This can be written in some uh, notion of, of, uh, of, of uh, something that looks like a vector product uh, with some derivatives. Again, I mean, it is OK for the understanding of the next of the slides just to consider this, uh, this equation uh, in coordinates. Uh, on curve domains, the curl usually has like other definitions. But essentially, uh, the, the picture is the same. We just want to uh, compute uh, the spinning or uh, the rotation of the, of the fluid. And the interesting bit about these two components, the velocity <coughs> And the vorticity is that, um, yeah. I will, okay, so I just missed the slide, so I, I, will, I will get back to this. Um, yeah. The, the, the interesting bit about the, the velocity and the vorticity is that they fully uh, describe uh, the motion of the fluid. And uh, th this is 
given by, by this equation. And uh, the way to, to actually understand this is that we say that the vorticity, uh, for instance, just assume that you are given the vorticity here in time zero, it is actually being transported by the velocity of the fluid. So for instance, let's simplify the problem a lot. Let's just consider a fixed vector field. And we trace its flow lines, like mu short. And you can say that the vorticity at time t is nothing else but the vorticity at time zero being transported to this point. So in some sense, if we are located at this point in time, we just go back in time, ask what is the vorticity, and we put it here. OK, so let me just go back to, to this uh, slide, because it is important. Um, one thing that, uh, that is uh, cool in 2D is that <clears throat> if we again consider this, this equation for the relation between velocity and vorticity, so we say that we, we take this uh, something that is, looks like, like a vector product, and usually you will assume that the, the vorticity or the curl of some vector field is actually a vector. But in 2D, it turns out that this vector always points out in the normal direction of the surface. So if it points out in the normal direction of the surface, we can might as well just take the norm of this vector and just consider this as a scalar function. And this is actually what we do. So in, in the rest of the slides, and this is only true in 2D, in the rest of the slides, the, the curve, uh, sorry, the vorticity is just a scalar function. So for instance, the vorticity that is uh, associated with this velocity is this function. And this should be regarded or considered by you as just two vertices ju that point uh, in the same direction. So for instance, this is a counterclockwise rotation. OK, so let's go back uh, to this, this equation that we get. And <clears throat> as I said, um, knowing the vorticity and velocity is enough to completely model the fluid. And this is given by, by this equation here. And in some sense, this equation is somewhat uh, simpler than, than what we already showed, uh, saw, because we saw before something that also involved the divergence and another vector. And here we just project the gradient of, of this uh, vorticity onto the velocity. However, uh, this equation is nonlinear because the velocity and the vorticity are coupled. So now the velocity is not fixed anymore. It actually changes in time and it actually uh, affects uh, the vorticity and it's also affected by, by this integration. But nevertheless, we'll actually uh, forget about this now and we write, uh, go right uh, into the discretizing it uh, by, uh, as I said, trying to simplify stuff. So, as we saw before, we can just uh, consider explicit integration, and this is nothing else uh, uh, as the same rule that we saw before. And, <clears throat> and one of the problems uh, uh, with explicit integration is that it will be conditionally stable at best. So what does that mean? Um, I won't go into too many details here, but... <clears throat> There are several ways to perform stability analysis on uh, partial differential equations. And one of the uh, most uh, common or popular ways to, to perform this is to assume a von Neumann uh, stability analysis. So just assume that we are interested in this omega. And let's say that we are interested in omega at step n. So I'm just uh, forgetting time for a second. And just say that I have a sequence of omegas and this is the only on, on, on this uh, step number n. And the stability analysis will show us that this guy is approximately some, some number that is dependent on some eigenvalues. Um, let's leave it for a second. Multiply by n, we multiply by, by some other coefficient, which is, which is uh, actually, um, it is bounded. And <clears throat> in some sense, this already allows us to, to get a very nice and simple stability rule. And since this number is raised to the power of n, we just need this guy to be smaller than 1, essentially. Because if it doesn't, then 
over time, this will accumulate and get uh, exponentially large. And one can show that with explicit uh, schemes, this actually uh, this is actually greater than one uh, for for a lot of uh, problems. So it will actually uh, go up in finite time. Um, <coughs> so. <coughs> Uh, what I try to motivate is that explicit integration schemes are not the best uh, uh, stuff to do uh, in all cases. And one way to solve this and is to say, okay, here the right hand side was actually taken by the, from the time derivative of this logicity. But in some sense, we arbitrarily chose that we will take the velocity at time t and the vorticity at time t. But we might as well, we might as well consider these uh, quantities on different types. So for instance, let's say, let's leave everything uh, at the same time, but just change the last vorticity to be the future vorticity. How can we actually interpret this equation? Um, so we can say, um, we can say that this equation is in some sense implicit, and this equation is specifically semi-implicit, because in order to compute the right-hand side for the evolution, we don't really have the full details at this moment, because we just have the vorticity and the velocity. But in order to actually compute the evolution in time, we actually need the future vorticity. So how we, how we actually uh, go and, and solve this? One way is to say, okay, let's take uh, uh, the components uh, on uh, specific times um, and, and, and let's gather uh, the objects. So since we have vorticity on time t here, it stays here on the right hand side and we will take these components and we will start this together. So we have the identity minus this guy here. Okay? And you can see that what I did is just took this delta t uh, and v and just consider this as an operator that actually acts on this function. And mathematically, this equation here just means that we have a linear equation that we need to solve per, uh, per time. And you can see that if we have the vorticity at time t and the velocity at time t, then we can compute this guy and we can compute this guy in order to find this graph. And how do we do that? We will just use any linear solver in order to invert uh, this matrix. Now, actually, uh, <coughs> this object here, this V uh, with, gra with, with the gradient object, is actually more fundamental. And in differential geometry, it is known that vector fields are actually associated to differential operators uh, which are nothing else but uh, computing the directional derivative of functions. So if we take this guy that we saw before and we now denote it by dv, so dv is an operator that acts on functions, so it takes functions and maps those to the directional deriv derivatives of these functions. So let's see an example. So basically, this function here is just a y-coordinate function of the sphere, uh, ranging from minus 1 to 1 here. And for the vector field, we just take the gradient of this function. So basically, it points uh, up um, on this sphere. And if we want to compute this directional derivative, we will basically get if the vector field is the gradient of y, and we also take y as a function, we will get nothing else but the norm of the gradient of y. <coughs> and this is what you see here. This is something like the linear approximation of this uh, quadratic function. <coughs> okay, so this is just an example. In practice, uh, we need to discretize this operator. So again, we, uh, I will go about this quickly. So again, we, we assume that we have piecewise linear functions and piecewise con constants vector fields. And in, in order to, to build this operator of this matrix, we need to do nothing else but to apply it to each of the basis elements uh, that we have. So just assume that you have this vector field and you just compute uh, its 
uh, action on each of the hat basis elements that you have. If you place those on the cones of, of this matrix, you will get a matrix which is square in the size of the number of vertices, essentially. And uh, it, it is really very simple to actually con construct it in practice because what you basically need to do is to take the gradient operator that we actually saw before and we need what we try to encode here is the inner product between the vector field and the gradient. So one way to do that in a matrix formulation is just place the components of the vector um, on the diagonals so we get a blow diagonal matrix and if we place it here, we'll just get the inner product uh, pointwise. And since uh, these multiplications uh, will uh, end up on the faces, we interpolate uh, from the faces to the vertices. So this is just an ex explanation for the, for the last project. OK. Um, yeah, th this, uh, this might be uh, not, not so intuitive uh, to see at first, but Essentially, what, what I try to, to motivate you is that the construction of this operator is very, very similar to the actual continuous uh, definition. Uh, so once we have this operator, we can just shuffle this around in order to construct new ones. Um, that, that, that's basically the idea. Okay, so I will show a couple of results and, and we'll finish uh, with this. So this is a result on this um, hyperbolic surface. So essentially, we have these two lines of vertices, which are uh, uh, with different sides, but the same strengths. And what actually happens is a very uh, interesting behavior. Uh, you can see that stuff actually develops. Yeah. So you can see that we only work on the shell, right? We, we, we don't really have like interior. Um, another example is uh, something like a jet uh, flow. Uh, basically what you should assume is something like, um, like a chimney that has this uh, uh, flow of, of, of gas out of it. Uh, but but it, this also shows up in, in nature actually, not, not only um, in this example. Okay, and this is and the last example. Um, so we have these two vertices, and what happens here is that when they actually touch the boundary, uh, there is a, a creation of additional vertices um, that, uh, that actually um, uh, come and, and take, take place in, the, in this uh, simulation. And this uh, basically happens due to the uh, viscosity that we have in the model. But uh, <coughs> since I didn't explain it, so <coughs> just that. Okay. So that's basically it. Okay. <coughs> so we've seen so far um, various representations. So there was this, uh, I can look at a vector field as a point at every location, or I can look at it uh, as an operator, which takes a function and gives me back a function. And uh, so basically different representations are little bit different, uh, different problems. The last, problems uh, the last problem I'm going to talk about is actually one of the most research problems in vector fields processing, and this is uh, the design of vector so the idea here is that somebody gives you a body again. You could do it on other models as well. I'll <laughs> <laughs> uh, use the body. Uh, so you're giving the body and now you're given some additional input such as you know, strokes on, on the body and so on. And you want to generate a vector field which doesn't necessarily have some physical meaning. But it can be useful, useful to uh, generate care or, or, or fur. Um, and this is kind of an ill-posed Ill problem, right? Like, what do I mean by generate a vector field? I wanted to fulfill the constraint. So basically, in the location where the user specified the curve, I want the streamline of the vector field to follow the curve. But what about all the other locations where the user didn't say anything? So as with any design problem, the goal is to have intuitive modeling. And intuitive modeling in general means that there's uh, little variation. So if the user specified 
that there is some sort of uh, uh, sync here, then there shouldn't pop up various things in various other locations for the user to know about. Okay, so if you're trying to design somebody's head with the hair, you don't want him to have you know, thumbs all around or you don't want him to, want it to behave in some pain uh, way. And obviously you want it to be fast, because if it's going to be interactive and you want to be able to modify the vector field, then this thing should be uh, So we're talking about modeling that there's a user in, in the loop, but then we have to say, okay, what can the user say about the vector field? So, uh, like I said, you can face stream and curves, or, or you might want to say, okay, at this point I have vortex, vortex, okay, so the vector field is going to rotate. And in different places I have sources in sync, so I have some fluid coming out or some uh, source of, of fluid coming out. And uh, eventually we want to take all this information that the user specified together with the geometry of the object and kind of hook this into an optimization problem which will give me back the vector field. Okay, so how do I go about taking this input, taking vortices and sinks and streamlines and generating a vector field out of it? So if I want to specify the vortices, you've actually seen a method just uh, in you know, reason, right? We said that if we look at the, uh, at the curl of a vector field, yeah, so in, in 2D, in fact, uh, you can uh, take the curl of the vector field and it's simply a function. And the curl is directly related to the way that, you know, to the vortices that I have in, in my vector field. So one way to specify the hypothesis is to say, okay, I pick a point on the surface which has a vortex, and I say this is the curl. And then I reconstruct the vector field in some no way that, that it's done. So this, this kind of closes the, the vortices in the part. But how do I go about specifying sources and sinks? So previously in the simulation, um, we actually pushed forward the, the vorticity and then we generated the velocity. The vorticity and the velocity were kind of hand in hand. But uh, this only works if you assume that uh, there are no sources in the sinks, right? So the, in the simulation that you've seen with the chimneys, there's no fluid coming in and no fluid coming out of the surface. And this makes sense because this is how the, um, the conditions were specified. But similarly, <coughs> if I do want sources in sinks, okay? So instead of specifying the I can specify the divergence. So the divergence, as we mentioned before, kind of measures how much stuff comes in minus how much stuff comes out. And in fact, there's a very nice theorem in, in two dimensions, which is called, uh, well, in three dimensions as well, in two dimensions also functions, which is called the Hoche decomposition theorem. So basically, if you give me two functions which are the curve of, of a vector field and the divergence of a vector field, I can give you back the vector field. And the way to do this is basically to solve a Poisson equation. So again, referring to the last uh, <laughs> drama we talked about at the end, uh, you take, the, you take a function, you solve a Poisson equation, basically looking for a function whose Laplacian is the vorticity, and looking for a function whose Laplacian is the divergence, and this gives you back the function. And now if you take the gradient of one, you get a vector field, and you take the gradient of the other, and just this J thing is just you rotate it by, by you know, 90 degrees, then this gives you back the vector field, which has exactly this divergence. Okay? So I can go back and forth from divergence to the vector field, without losing information. I'm cheating a bit, as we said before, because I'm assuming genus zero and there are no harmonic vector fields and so on, so if you know about it, just this does some slight cheating. So this, in this case, it only works on uh, bodies without holes. Um, okay, so if I do this and I solve this uh, equation, then the first part of my vector field is going to be this rotating vector field here, and the second part is going to be a gradient, okay? So, uh, something which uh, goes to Okay, so I said I want to do vector field design, I want to specify the constraints. If I just want to say what is the sources of the sinks and the focuses, then I can do budget composition and I'm done. Uh, but I wanted to do other stuff, right? I wanted to specify exactly the direction, not only sources and sinks. It it's not enough information to specify the vector field everywhere. And I want to disclose it. Unfortunately, if I want to plug this into some sort of optimization problem, I have to define my optimization variables, and these constraints are given as vectors. Okay. So, how do I go about specifying, okay, the vector at some point on the surface has to be in some direction? If I give it, let's say, three coordinates, let's say a point, that should, the, the vector should be x, y, z coordinate, then I have to have a constraint that it's tangent to the surface, which is annoying. If I just specify two directions, then I have to say, okay, in which frame is this defined on the surface? Because if I just pick a random triangle, I don't have any, any x and y 
prescribe directions to begin with. So it's not clear what should the optimization variable be when I try to write this down. So going back to cheating and say, okay, you know, forget about vector fields. Can I somehow define these vector fields in terms of scalar functions? I know how to do scalar functions. I know how to optimize them. And now I'm going to do a small detour and then come back to vector fields. So the way to go to <coughs> the way to go to scalar functions is to work with a beast, which is called a open beast. The reason I call it a beast is because it's not visually visualizable. So I like to see my math in pictures. Taking the covector and making a picture out of it is, is not true, but let's try nevertheless. So a vector, a single vector is just two numbers. Okay, just an, uh, an object, not two. A two vector is a function, okay, is a functional, actually, which takes two numbers and gives you back a function. So if this is my vector, okay, the corresponding covector is going to be for every point in R2, take the point, take U, and do an inner product. Okay, so for every point in R2, I get a number, and I color for this number. Okay? So if this is my vector, the function, this um, you know, color coding of this region, which says for every point, what is the corresponding number, is the code. And since it's seriously tedious to <coughs> specify these functions for every point in the plane, I'm going to kind of abstract it away, and I'm going to represent the code vector as the isolines of this function. Okay? And since direction is important, the thicker the isoline, the, the, uh, the, the bigger the, the skin of all of this thing. And so, so, how can you make a product of the point in the vector? Ah, uh, yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm looking at you as the vector representing that. Uh, so, I'm looking at two numbers as a vector in R2, okay, not as a point. Okay, so if I have here xy, so this is the vector xy. Okay, yeah. Uh, but you can look at it differently. You can say, okay, if I have these uh, isolines and I take just uh, I take a vector u, the way to say what the number would be is to put it here and to let's say measure how many like, how many lines you have sent. Okay. okay. So uh, given this guy's uh, covector, now let's say I rotate my vector, then the covector will also rotate, and now you know my other lines rotate. So if a vector field was at every point in the plane I specify a direction <laughs> and a length, a covector, uh, a one form is a covector field. Okay, so at every point in the plane I specify this functional, which is a vector and gives me back a number. So the way to visualize this is this. Okay, in every point, my corresponding I have a vector field. The corresponding uh, covector is this uh, bunch of isolines, which tells me if I take some other vector and I plug it in. What will the number be? Okay, so for every choice of the vector that I plug in here, I'll get a new number. And I have this all over the, the, the domain. Okay, so now it seems like I wanted something simple to represent, uh, you know, vector fields with functions so I can optimize it for, I optimize for it, and I just made things more complicated by introducing these guys, which are functions. But <laughs> do not lose hope. Uh, the idea is to take these, these covector fields and, and integrate them. Okay, so now let's say I have a curve. Remember the user is giving me curves. I can look at the following number. I can say, okay, walk along the curve, and now at every point on the curve, take the tangent to the curve and feed it to the covector. It will give me a number. And then I have at another point, I'm feeding another vector, it will give me another number. And now I'm summing all these numbers up. So for every curve that you give me, and this covector field, I get a number, okay, which represents the covector field and thus represents the vector. Okay? In fact, this is kind of a very complicated way of saying, okay, take this, uh, uh, take this curve and at every point along the curve, take the inner product between the vector and uh, the, the tangent of the curve and the vector and sum. The reason you need to, to, to do all this uh, shuffling and go back and forth between vectors and, and it's kind of uh, non-trivial to, to explain in the Euclidean domain. You have to go to a surface to understand the, the relationship. But, um, so for, for the um, you know for the goal of designing vector fields in 2D, you don't need all this stuff. You don't need the covector fields. You just to, uh, need to look at the inner products of the vector with the tangent to the curve. But the reason I wanted to go into that is because if you look up any type of literature on vector fields, you will end up uh, seeing these one forms and I think it's kind of Nice to see some sort of uh, explanation for what they are. So now that I have my integrated one forms on some general curve, 
I can look at a discrete one. So a discrete one form is going to be, okay, take an edge of the mesh. That's a curve, right? It's just a line. And now take it the integrated inner product of the projection. Uh, sorry, the integrated inner product of your vector, <coughs> your vector field with this edge. Okay, so at every point I have uh, a vector, I'm taking the inner product in the direction of the edge and then summing it up. This is basically the definition that I said before, just on an edge. Now I have a correspondence between every edge of my mesh to a number. And this correspondence represents a vector field on my surface, on my body. And this vector field doesn't have to be a vector per face, like it was in the previous cases. It can be anything. It can be, let's say, piecewise linear and the vertices, or piecewise quadratic, or whatever you want. All I'm interested in to get to this representation is this integral value of the projection of the vector field on the edge. So I'm, I'm uh, denoting it by uh, Cij, okay? I have my vector field V and I have an edge Ij. Cij is going to be the, the coefficient um, of the edge I. And now I'm going to use these Cij as my variables, okay? So if I want to design a vector field, I'm going to hook up um, um, a vector of length E, which is the number of edges in my mesh. For every edge, I'm going to have a number, and this number is going to be, uh, going to, all these numbers together are going to represent but now I have a way to specify directions, specifying a uh, vector field. But I have to go back and say, okay, how do I do color and color? That's interesting. Right? So um, again, I have my body up here and the three design the poles, okay, color, stream, and divergence. And I have to say how I do every one of them. And then we'll hook everything together into this big optimization problem, which we'll be back. So the way to do that, uh, to do color, right, so I'm going to have my variables, I'm going to be one of the edge. And then, uh, I'm going to show the constraint. The way to do curl is to use Stokes theorem. Okay? So if you did any type of course in multivariate calculus at the end of the semester, then you end up with Stokes theorem. And uh, then the following integral is shown in some, or some uh, variants of it. If you want to take the integral of the curl of a sum domain, okay, then instead of looking at the integral of the curl in an area, some integral over the boundary of the domain. And the boundary of the domain, you have to look at the, at the vector field that you want to take the curl of, in a product with the tangent to the boundary. Okay? And this says that if I want to measure how uh, uh, fluid spins inside the domain, all the, the spinning inside the domain is going to cancel out. The only thing that will matter if I integrate everything together is what happens on the boundary. Okay? But this is kind of neat because this is exactly the definition that we had for a discrete, for an integrated one form, right? We said we take a vector field, we look along the path, and we kind of sum up the, the contribution. So this is just nothing else than if I look at a given triangle and I want to know, okay, what is the curl on, of the vector field on my triangle? I can say, okay, just integrate uh, this one form over the edges of the triangle. Um, and since my, my one form was represented basically as this coefficient, okay, if I have a triangle IJK, yeah, and I want to know the curl of the triangle IJK, all I have to do is sum up these coefficients. Now there's a sign here, which is kind of uh, the most annoying thing in implementing this thing, is keeping track of the sign. So I have to assign every edge of the mesh, I have to assign a direction. Okay? Because like I've shown all the way, one forms have some specified direction. When I'm doing an integral, I'm integrating in some direction. Okay? So every edge has a direction. And the triangle also has some sort of direction. Okay, let's say clockwise or uh, counterclockwise. So this sign here indicates whether the direction of the triangle agrees with the direction of the edge. So here and here they agree, and here they don't, so I have a minus. And this bookkeeping of keeping track of the, the orientation is kind of uh, annoying, but it, this is the, like, the only technical difficulty in the implementation. So now if the user says, okay, I want the curl in some, okay, I want a vortex here, okay, then you basically pin down the triangle and say the curl here is going to be 1. And this translates to the constraint that the sum of these coefficients is going to be 1. And now I have a linear constraint. Okay. So I want to hook up a bunch of curls and then solve. And if the user specified that this triangle is going to be zero, uh, 1 and this is all we specified, then I'm assuming that all the others have to be 0. So I have to specify the curl for all the triangles to, to be able to solve it. Okay, so we're, we're done with curl. Next one is the emergence. 
Uh, similarly, you might have been talking instead of the Stokes theorem, the divergence theorem, which are actually the same. So if you go through this uh, one form formalism, uh, the, the, one of the nicest things is that everything kind of falls together to, to I mean, the, the math is very nice and you can uh, show up nice generalizations. But anyway, if you want to compute the divergence of an area, you can again map it to some uh, you know, function out of the boundary. But now, instead of taking the inner product of your vector with the tangent, you have to take the inner product with the vector with the normal, which sucks, because we don't have this information, right? We're encoding on my edges only the inner product between the vector and the tangent. So now, okay, I have to make up some information which I don't have. So again, we cheat. <coughs> okay, I need, let's say I meant the dotex, I need to, um, um, <coughs> Okay, so I can do this on the triangle, right? If I had to do this on the triangle, I would, I would need to know the normal, um, normal projection, which I don't have. So what I do is I rotate, uh, I take the vertices, okay, and I'm computing the vertices of the triangles. And now I'm looking at all the, all the edges which are uh, neighboring the vertex, and I'm rotating them at pi over 2. Okay? And I'm building this kind of uh, dual cell, okay, this uh, uh, region which surrounds the, the, the vertex, and I'm doing the integration of that. But um, now that I did it, okay, I uh, rotated the edges by 90 degrees, I can also rotate the field with the vector field by 90 degrees. So if you compute in a product of two things, or you compute in a product of the same two things, both rotated by pi over 2, you get the same number. So this is the trick here. I'm rotating, rotating my pi over 2 the, uh, both the mesh and the vector field. And then everything works. Then I have my, my, uh, my coefficients and I can use them. And the only difference is that the sum is over the, this x here is supposed to mean the one wing of the vertex. I was too lazy to draw one wing of the vertex. Okay. Um, but you need this thing to close. You need, you need, if you just take the edges of the, uh, the emanating from the vertex and kind of rotate them by 90 degrees, they don't close. They don't form a closed loop. So the way to get them to close is to scale them. Okay? And there's a very nice relation, again, to the cotangent function, that the way we scale the edges such that uh, everything closes nicely is to multiply them by the cotangent. Okay. So what happens in the end is that uh, the divergence around the vertex is given by the sum of the same, uh, well, now instead of uh, summing around the triangle, you're summing all, over all the edges that emanate from the vertex, and now you have uh, all, all the coefficients, yeah, I have ij, ik, il, im, if I have uh, like four edges, but I have this weighting in, the, in front of them. So the star ij thing is nothing else than the cotangent weights for uh, the edge ij, or one over the cotangent. Some, something which is given in terms of the Okay, cool. So with that one, how about we have total and divergence? Uh, the next thing is we have a streamline, so again, the user draws something, but this is easy, right? We know how to do this. Uh, because we can say, take all the edges which this flow line intersects, okay? And then specify that on this edge, my coefficient that I'm working with is just the inner product between the tangent to the curve and the edge, the vector of the edge, okay? So I'm taking the vector of the edge, the ij, and the tangent to the curve, computing the, the inner product, and now I have a number of the edge. Okay. Um, so now I can take all these constraints together, yeah, the vorticity, the uh, divergence, and the streamlines, and uh, build this humongous um, matrix. Okay, so the matrix here, uh, this D guy is basically just incidence relationships, which map, which says for every triangle what is the corresponding edges. Uh, delta is the same incidence relationships between uh, vertices and edges with this additional tangent weights uh, going in. And Z is just, um, you, know, you know, like indicators which kind of uh, look up the edges which my strokes intersect. Okay? So on the left here I have this uh, system matrix, and on the right is the, you know, the curve, the divergence, and the, 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 the numbers that they use to the strokes. Now obviously this thing doesn't necessarily have a solution, right? I just feel it's going to be an over-constrained system, because if you sum things up, then I have here I have uh, T, like the number of triangles here, I have the number of vertices, and I might here have here some arbitrary number of stroke constraints. So uh, that's the many constraints, and I have E variables. Uh, so basically, we do what we always do in graphics when faced with uh, a problem which doesn't have a solution, we solve it in the least square sense. So we build a, um, basically <coughs> minimizing the least square error of this uh, expression. Uh, there are some more details to take care of. For example, 
once I'm done with this, I have these numbers for edge, but now I don't have a vector for it. Right? So if I want to draw it, let's say, as a, as a vector for a face, I don't know how to visualize this. Okay? I don't know how to visualize a number for edge. But there's a nice, uh, very simple way of saying, okay, if the output that you wanted is, let's say, a piecewise um, a linear vector field, then you can project these uh, one form uh, numbers and get the corresponding piecewise linear vector field. But I won't go into that. It's really late to that one. Um, so just to show some results, um, okay, this is uh, it's kind of you know low quality rendering, but uh, you can see the triangles I hope. So this is one sink, and you have all the uh, um, arrows pointing at the sink, and here you have two vortices and another sink. Uh, so nice things, nice things about this, and this was generated by a student. Uh, the nice thing about this, um, this construction is that you're guaranteed that there are no extra singularities. Okay, so if I am going to get exactly the vortices and the things and the sources that I specified, and if I don't specify any more strokes, this is exactly what I need. Okay? Um, and interestingly, on a, uh, you might have heard of the Harry Bolt theorem, so the user might be able to specify. Uh, constraints which are not feasible. So, for example, let's say I have a sphere and I specify a single source. This can't work, right? Because if I have a single source and stuff comes out, it has to go somewhere. It cannot just fall off. So, what will happen is during this least square solutions, you're going to find uh, this, uh, the um, uh, algorithm is automatically going to place the, the sink in, uh, in the best location. Okay? Um, so, this is one example of a vector that you get using a single source. <coughs> uh, this is to show you that there are no additional singularities. We're not hiding them behind the host, well, we, the authors. <laughs> not hiding them. And the, and the <coughs> thing is at the roof here. Um, right, and the result that I'm showing now is actually taking the, this uh, vector field that you get and applying it for texture synthesis. So you don't see an arrow at every point. You don't see an arrow at every point here. You see these, um, uh, these lines. I have some texture exemplar that I'm uh, using it and the vector field to generate this uh, texture synthesis. So I can specify a single direction and get this kind of nice smooth uh, vector field, or I can specify uh, three directions in kind of a rotating and in spiral and so on. This is kind of very, it's very um, uh, flexible. Okay, so to recap the, the vector field design application. You can design vector fields quite easily by specifying the divergence, the curl, and some point by constraints. Perhaps the limitation of this approach is that you have to specify the curl everywhere uh, and the divergence everywhere. And there are many, 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 many follow-up approaches for vector field design. This paper is from 2007, so I wouldn't say that you know this is the latest and greatest. But if you're interested in vector field, this is perhaps uh, one place to start looking into uh, possible applications. Um, the main thing here was that we didn't have to, to work with vector fields as, um, you know, or, or as vector quantities on the surface. We represented them as scalars on edges. Okay, and this allowed us to build um, um, to build optimization and to make it uh, quite efficient. This actually runs in real time. Okay, so the system matrix you can prefactor it, and then uh, it's uh, um, and and we solve it with uh, with weighted. So this is one of the, like I said, it's one of the leading options for vector field design. There are other options, for example, using the machinery that Omri has showed for um, simulation. You can also uh, do vector field design, and you can design other constraints. Okay, so nobody said that the constraints that I showed are the best ones. For every application, you might have different constraints. Um, okay, so I guess everybody somewhere in this uh, setting, and well, after the, the next talk. I just want to um, give some closing remarks about uh, the last hour and a half. I think the Hit Dungeon vector fields are, are um, very interesting. Okay? They pose many challenges which are non trivial, and they involve the geometry of the surface in, in uh, ways which are very nice. The biggest challenges, I think, is to find a, a convenient geometric representation which is easy to work with. So there are many, you've seen a bunch of operators like divergence, and curl, and power transport, and I mentioned. Um, but there are many others which we, we didn't go into. And in the smooth theory, in the smooth case, when you have a smooth surface, everything is known. And the differential geometry has been here for, I don't know, K, K hundreds of years. 
Um, but in the discrete case, things just don't add up. So it's very interesting to see how can you build discrete operators which kind of agree with each other and, and mimic the continuous setting. Um, every representation has its advantages and disadvantages you can do. So this thing that I just showed, it's called the uh, exterior couples, discrete exterior couples. You can do fluid simulation with that. You can do design with operators, um, mix and match, and so on. And finally, there are many, many open research, open research questions. So if you find this uh, direction interesting, um, you know, go into it. So.